Hi, hi, everybody. I raise a glass to you all. Happy, happy hour. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about things that your kids don't want, but also I want to make a, a little statement before we get going, which is uh, something I wrote about our particular time that we're going through, because I live on the Riviera, and so many people are putting stuff out on the curb. They're getting rid of so much. And I thought, well, everybody's been cleaning out their houses. So I wrote a piece for you to introduce our talk tonight. It's called In Praise of Materialism. And it's, it's getting on to summer and you may be thinking of the autumn to come and you may be thinking of preserving part of your history because you never know what might come along. And I would suggest to you that now might be a good time to consider making a file or a collection of, of thoughts on objects that you consider important. And I would also consider that you might want to think about going back to a couple generations with your notes. Because this file is going to be your narrative, and this is going to be a way that you can tell the story of those objects. And I'm going to come up with some ideas of how you can do that a little bit later in the talk. But the way to um, preserve objects for your family is to make those objects tell a story, and that will get the younger generation interested. You know, our talk today is no thanks, mom, the top 10 things your kids don't want. But there is a way to get the younger generations interested and that's by creating a narrative. Um, unless it's a narrative, a thing is just a thing, if you think about it. And uh, most of the younger generation, if they don't want a thing, that's because they're inundated by things. Things are ubiquitous. And so what is not ubiquitous is the story you might tell about those things. So speak to the younger generation in a language they might understand with pictures. And the file that you create might be as simple as a key between the picture on the wall. In my house, I'd put masking tape numbers on those. And then I actually have a file on the computer and I have a real file in a shoebox with three by five cards. And I explain to my kids, you know, this is what this is. This was your grandmother's or great grandmother's, et cetera. And so I use that file. They haven't discovered it yet, but it's a file that I'm, I've been adding to as we've been quarantined. So what are some things that might end up in that file? And I have some thoughts for you before we get started with the PowerPoint. Here's some of the things that are in my file. My son's first handmade object in clay, my beloved old former dog's tag and collar, a photo of a wedding that is an important thing in the, in the family, um, my mom's handwritten recipe for something, my granddad's army dog tags, one of the, my daughter's excellent report cards, a fine college essay by one of my kids that worked, a piece of jewelry from each grandmother, an ancestor's passport and an old driver's license, a few foreign coins marked in magic marker with the date of a trip, a scarf or hanky which wafts an important person's perfume or aftershave, a few old house keys identified in an envelope of past homes with a photo, a photo of me and a new grandchild, a favorite photo of a partner or partners. You don't have to actually have a reason for it. Just put a bunch in there. Something to remind you of your kids' favorite songs and why at different points in their life. Something someone handmade for you. Something I wrote to someone but never sent. Uh, a list of your 10 most treasured objects might be something you might run right about. Uh, someone's old hat, someone's old eyeglasses, a shell or rock from somewhere special, and that's a label on it where that special place was, your first camera. And so these are some of the thoughts um, that are in my file because these objects hold memories and symbolism for me, and not everything in our life needs to be purged. Um, objects, and I point out to you, objects are called belongings for a certain reason, if you think about the word belongings. So uh, you create a space for this private material record of your material life and specify what they are in a video or a voice recording if you don't wanna actually write them down. Or write this in a letter to your heirs with a list. Like I said, you know, the, just a, an identification code between the, the, the file you're making and the object contained. 
It can be virtual, it can be a real shoebox. And the way I describe this and people say, well, really, I mean, why is that necessary? You know, I'm an appraiser and I've been in people's homes for 30 years. And when I go through a house uh, for a client and um, the client's children are there, for example, if the client has passed away, I find bags of eyeglasses and baggies of old keys with no labels. And usually those things are tossed. I find kids milk teeth without any attribution. And so if you are gonna be saving those objects, my urge to you tonight is maybe tell people why you save those objects. So what would your life look like without memories in material form? And we are all living examples of O2 to solid flesh and we contain our own memories, but they're in our heads. So the uses of the world, to keep the Shakespearean metaphor going, are those significant objects in your own world. And don't let the anti-clutter gurus tell you otherwise. So with that, let's get started with our, our PowerPoint presentation. So we do share screen. Okay. So we do slideshow and from beginning. Okay, can, can everybody see that? Okay, so the, the, the presentation tonight is No Thanks Mom, the top 10 objects your kids don't want. And I start by mentioning to you that value as a concept is different to different generations. So the stuff of our lives is truly the stuff that make up our lives. So material possessions reflect our personalities, our philosophies, our culture, our economics. And the phrase is, I get this from my clients, does it matter, Elizabeth? Well, interestingly enough, that word matter. Matter means material. Now I think about the material things of life, and that is matter itself. But for the first time in the history of our, our world, four generations are downsizing simultaneously. So your 80 to 90 year old parents and you, the boomers, the Gen Xers, the millennials, there's all kinds of people, especially now with the COVID crisis, a lot of people are downsizing. And then, you know, a lot of people are thinking about writing a will or a trust right now. Some of those possessions you might think about actually writing about in those wills or trusts. So this particular lecture is about telling those stories. And sometimes the objects can tell those stories themselves. But you can use those objects in creative, non-objectifying ways. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the millennials and why they're not interested in some of our things. A big part of that is because the millennials have a buying power worldwide of 2.5 trillion with a T dollars. So when you've got that much buying power, the millennials command the market. If they don't want a type of object, there is no market for that. For that object and that means a kind of a sad future for a lot of the objects that uh, my generation has saved for example we're going to talk about those categories there are 10 things that you should think about saving for your kids we talked a little bit about that in the first part um, in praise of materialism you might think about saving for your kids your first passport your military discharge paper papers, one wedding photo, one object belonging to your oldest relative, a meaningful piece of jewelry, a photo of you and a newborn, a favorite teacher's comment, a beloved dog tag, an object from both grandparents, small things. And there's 10 things that are big that your kids don't want. And my first remedy for saving these declined treasures is to document these treasures for your kids visually. And some of my clients, I, I, I coach them to actually take a video or a photo a camera and go through the house and document and make a, a um, memory stick or a CD as they're narrating what those objects mean and, and send those CDs or memory sticks or, or do a Dropbox to your kids and say, you know, this is what I've been thinking about during this lockdown. Um, ask them to look and decide, is there anything that they want? And use the visual, use visual language. And so if they decline the object, at least they have, when it may matter to them, maybe they have children or grandchildren themselves, if they decline the object, they still have that visual, visual archive you've created for them. So now we get into the meat of the lecture, 
the top 10 objects, and we're going to start with number one, and there's the cover of my book, number one, books. So your kids don't want books. They don't want first editions. They don't want to, they just don't want books. Now this is, these are my books and they're all old books that over the years I've collected for my son. He says, you know, forget it, mama, I'm not interested. But the way you can actually think about selling these, and this is a little bit of a surprise, but the more specific the field, the better the market is. So I'll give you an example. I had a client who um, studied a very ancient type of Japanese language. And it, only like three or four scholars in the world studied that particular language. Those books sold for a lot because it, they were very, very, very specific. Now, for first editions, they oftentimes don't say first edition in the frontispiece. So you use an expert for that. And I would suggest Eric Kelly at the Book Den. He's very good. And he can advise you if you go through your books and you say, well, I just don't even know. I should just throw the whole, the whole lot out or put them on the street. Call Eric Kelly at the Book Den and he can go through that for you. Secondly, here's some more books. That's a professor I helped. Very specific. He had specific books and we sold those. And another professor, she had very specific books about Delft porcelain. We sold those because they were specific. Number nine, steamer trunks. Your kids don't want steamer trunks. And by the way, you're looking at my garage right now. I have three steamer trunks. Uh, they're beautiful, yes, but your kids don't want them. You know, the the steamer trunks. I get the I get emails all the time. Uh, is this worth anything? Absolutely not. I mean, everybody had a steamer trunk in the 19th century, so there really is very little market for these things, unless it's a Louis Vuitton or something like that. Old electronics. Your kids don't want old electronics. Uh, here's a good one. That's mine. It's an old church organ, portable church organ. Uh, that is that weighs about as much as I do. And if you think about it, what's on your cell phone is billions of times more uh, efficient as far as music making. Kids don't want that. Number eight, your kids do not want little porcelain figurines and collector's plates. Really, collector's plates. Uh, check this out. Your kids don't want those. And those are those Bradford exchange plates that, you know, many of my clients have in their um, garages. Uh, it, it, just something that your kids just will not want. And people say to me, what do I do with them? And um, I have an expression that you, the famous uh, scene in um, my uh, big fat Greek wedding where people are just throwing plates. That might be a good solution. These are not worth anything. So let's see. What else? Okay, now we are down to silver plated objects. Silver plated objects are very hard for people to give away because a lot of thrift stores are not interested and they're almost able to give to your kids. Why is that? Because they have to be polished because you really can't store them in plastic to keep the polish because that plastic will adhere to the silver plating. Um, how do you know if they're silver plate or sterling? Because sterling is worth something, silver plate is not. Well, I give you an example. You see here it says silver soldered, that means plate. And then international silver coat, that sometimes also means plate, believe it or not. But you can go online and take a look, what's the differentiation between sterling and silver plate? There's also a really good way to tell. I use my face. Because uh, if you hold something to your face, it'll warm up much quicker than if you hold something that's silver. And the, the conductivity of silver is remarkable. And that's a way to tell. Uh, oh, here's a big hint. If it says Roger 1847, I get phone calls all the time. I have something from 1847 and I'll say that's Roger's brothers, right? And they go, how did you know that? Well, it's, that is not a date, that's a company name. Rogers Brothers 19, 1847 is a company name. Uh, so that is not silver. This is what silver plate looks like if you've wrapped it in plastic for too long. And this was wrapped in a dry cleaning bag. And it's, it's pr pretty much, it's so pitted that it's completely destroyed and worth nothing. Let's go to number six, heavy, dark, 
furniture, heavy dark furniture, uh, the value is in utilitarianism for furniture today. Remember we were talking about how it has changed and the concept of this. If you can't use it, you cannot sell it. And this is one of the, well, I see the bottom of the barrel as far as utilitarianism. Why is that? Because it's a sideboard. What were sideboards used for? They were used for serving pieces in the room and for storage of china. So they were used for silver plate and fine china. They were used for that kind of thing. And they usually sat across from the dining table. The issue with this is you just can't sell that because a, people don't dine that way. B, people don't store silver plate. We just, dis we, we just discussed why it was not uh, something anybody wanted of your millennial kids. So the kind of furniture that is dining room related is very difficult to sell. Um, the uh, I Ikea generation, for example, they do not want it. Here's something that I own, and it's a table in my house with this beautiful Italian inlay. And um, this is, my son likes to laugh at this and say, well, this is, you know, frou-frou, mom's frou-frou. This is um, overly designed. Um, this, by the way, this is Renaissance Revival and it's about 1870 to 1880. And it's a certain period in decorative arts history where over-design was the way, a way of things. This is actually very difficult to sell. Oh, number five, Persian rugs and sometimes we can call them world textiles, very difficult to sell. Um, this is, my partner John took this photo at six in the morning, he went out to State Street and laid up the rug down, there was no traffic, etc. This is a, a, a type of Persian rug, um, and this is a Bukhara, sorry, a Bukhara, and the issue is with this is that there's so many of these that the market doesn't want them, and also there's another reason for the, um, the dislike today of Persian rugs. And there is an exception, by the way, I should say, say that to you. The Persian rug market, if, if there's a rug that's older than the 19th century, they, uh, the market would be, will be interested. But if it's 19, I would say 1900s to now, it's really difficult to sell. One of the reasons is, if you take a look at this, You'll see those colors, and there's some, I really love these colors, but this doesn't work in a zen-like millennial interior now, does it? Just the wrong kind of color. Now, we mentioned the exceptions to, to and this is an exception because this is an exceptional prayer rug, and this dates to the 19th century. You can always tell a prayer rug because the prayer rug has an orientation. It, point it points the worshiper in a direction so be a little cautious when you go through your rugs and take a quick look at that number four linens okay linens hand embroidered uh beautifully worked here's one of my dish towels says thursday here's a pillowcase with little blue uh, uh embroidery etc Here's some beautiful napkins that are, were uh, emblazoned with my grandmother's crest. You know, uh, what, what the problem is with these, of course, is they need ironing and they're labor intensive. So if you wipe your mouth with such a thing, well, what are you gonna do? And I know my daughter-in-law wouldn't be interested, but this is labor intensive. And what to do with these things? Here's a linen closet, my client's linen closet. These are, it's all linen. And linen is a, a valuable fabric. And I have a lot of my clients that ask me, how do we get rid of this stuff? Beautiful lace tablecloths, et cetera. Get in touch with a wedding gown seamstress or somebody who makes uh, christening gowns. And that's a way to get rid of linens. Number three, sterling silver flatware. So, now this, you might say, well, of course there's silver content. So the silver content is valuable in itself. Yes, that is true. But unless the sterling is older than the 1930s, you know, we're talking about the, in between the war period and then by the second world war, the silver content in any flatware went down because the silver was used in the war effort. So anything that's older, any kind of flatware that's older than 1930, that could be valuable. 
but the stuff that you got or parents got, for example, my mother was married in 1956 or eight or something. She, she, she actually was given two sets of sterling for her wedding. Now, the issue with that is that is an era that is really difficult to sell. People don't really buy that era of sterling and it isn't really enough silver content to make it worthwhile selling. So, um, what, it, what why don't your millennial kids want this? Well, microwave, dishwasher, that kind of thing. So here's an interesting thing I wanted to point out to you. This is not sterling, so but this is 800 silver. Uh, this is a, some, sometimes called German silver. It's got a different kind of hallmark. So it has less silver content than sterling. Silver, sterling is 925 over a thousand parts uh, silver. This is 800 over a thousand parts silver. So there's less silver content in German um, in German uh, silver. Now the issue is with German silver, it can be worth as much as sterling because the designs are sort of Bauhausy, and that then the design thing saves it from being uh, fairly worthless. So, kind of if you're going through your silver understand that there's different silver gradations in any type of silver and not everything is sterling. Okay, then I just want to mention there's a subcategory in the silver and silver plate arena and that's that um, objects that are used for things that we don't use anymore. For example, if you look there's bread knives here and there's fish knives here and there's dessert spoons here and there's enameled uh, teaspoons here there's bread knives here, there's a knife sharpener here, uh, you know, butter pat knives. I mean, if you don't, they don't use those anymore. So these kind of things basically are very difficult to sell. Okay, now we get to something um, called wine services or beverage services. And what's so interesting about these glassware sets is that the younger generation doesn't care for them, and I'll tell you why. Take a look at the at the wine glasses. Do you remember at the beginning of the lecture when Daisha had that nice big glass of wine? These glasses hold maybe one fourth of what Daisha's glass holds, and I know my kids are just not interested in a wine glass that holds two gulps. But this was how the wine sets were. This particular set dates from the 1940s. You'll also notice as an aside that the champagne glasses are boats, champagne boats, not flutes. And when I showed this to my son, I said, look at these beautiful things. Your grandmother had this beautiful beverage set. Would you like to have it? He said, mom, we don't eat shrimp. I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, we don't eat shrimp. I said, what about shrimp? This is a, a beverage service. He said, look at those shrimp cups. No, those are champagne glasses. And that's my son who's 30 years old had never seen a champagne glass that shape. So uh, very difficult to sell, very difficult to give to your millennial kids. Here's another collection of barware. This is crystal. Some of the crystal that I run into in my clients' houses are worth something. You know, I'm thinking of Stuben, for example. Even Waterford is very difficult to get rid of because did you know that Waterford actually sold to a Chinese company? So basically that uh, Waterford is no longer Irish, etc. cetera. Uh, the wine glasses here are again too small. And what you would be tempted to do is to sort of lie to your kids and say, oh, well, these are the, these are the wine glasses. No, they're actually the water glasses. <laughs> but you could lie and try it. Um, Let's see, now we're getting to item number two. Item number two of our list, perhaps the worst and the hardest thing to say to you folks today is that your kids probably don't want your formal china. So this is in my china cabinet. I have Portuguese china, as you can see. I have um, Steubenville, which is a, a china from the 50s that I grew up with, etc. Your kids don't want that and it's basically to me, I said to my son, but it's a symbol of family celebrations. I mean, I've got, well, I've got Thanksgiving China that I've saved for you. I have Christmas China I saved for you. I have, uh, you know, the, the China that my mom put out for Christmas Eve, et cetera. Uh, so that was a total of five sets of China. 
He said, the problem is we've got no place to put it. They are un, um, unmicrowavable because a lot of them have gold trim or sometimes platinum, sometimes silver. And they are also very, very difficult to have in, in the dishwasher. So basically that makes them almost unsaleable. I have had a couple of clients that have really good luck selling their china to wedding caterers and party planners. Uh, because I know when my uh, son was married, um, my daughter-in-law, she didn't want to use any of the china that I have, but we we almost about to rent a uh, full service of antique china. And I didn't quite understand that. And that's because, well, if, if, we, if, I, if I sent my son and daughter-in-law that china, they'd have to store it somewhere. But if they rent it, it's, it comes and goes. So you might think about that. Here is my form of formal china. This is Wedgwood. And um, I like to joke with people that, yes, I have kind of flowery taste. This is um, a pattern that uh, the secretary of Sid Charisse, do you remember? She was a great dancer, dancing in the rain, et cetera. Dance with Jean Kelly. Uh, she, this was her china and I bought her secretary. It's Wedgwood and no the name of the pattern is not early brothel. It looks like it, but that's not the name of the pattern. Okay, now we're down to number one, the thing that your millennials have most problems with, and that's probably your boxes and boxes and boxes of family photos and greeting cards and old programs from ballets and theater performances and I'm, I know that you know exactly what I mean and this is a problem because there's so much of this now these this is my family photo box and if you look you'll see me going through the eras of my life here um, my son is so not interested in this but he is interested in keeping the photos so you know my partner is a professional photographer he's been trying to help me delight but then what do you do with these precious photos? I mean, I see myself at the first prom when I was dancing in the back, et cetera. You know, what do you do with them? Well, you can digitalize those, but there's um, a greeting card company called Found Image, and they do buy old photos. Have you seen those greeting cards where it's Uncle George and he's a little bit, you know, tipsy or something, and then there's a funny birthday greeting? So they sometimes buy that. Be careful because older photos are extremely flammable here's some more of my family photos that's me with the duck uh that's me with uncle george by the way um i, I just have box i have five boxes and it, it, and you know you say well you're a professional appraiser you've been appraising for 30 years you should get a handle on this stuff but it's hard to let these things go okay so what do you do I have five piles. It's my five pile theory of downsizing. You take cardboard boxes or you take your smartphone or you take your post-it notes and you label things as follows. The high rollers. What are the high rollers? The high rollers, these are great big French advertising posters that I collect. They're huge. They're as big as I am. And those are high rollers. These are really valuable. And um, when about what's truly valuable think about value in terms of centrality so talking about value in terms of money and these are truly valuable I make a, a promise to put that in that file i was telling you about with the card saying these are valuable these are from the late 19th century they went on those great big french um uh, things in the streets in paris the fine donations be very careful with things that you are interested in donating because it is tax deductible. So you need an appraisal for a, a donation over a certain figure and that figure is between 2,000 and 5,000. You have to be a little careful and then you would wanna call me for an appraisal because uh, you'll need my signature on the IRS 8283 non-cash charitable contribution form but you can sometimes make more money by donating than you can by selling because what you're doing is you're donating at a kind of an average value nationwide 
And when you sell, sometimes the market for selling things like here in Santa Barbara, the market for selling English furniture is very poor. Number three, the family jewels. And I don't mean necessarily just jewelry, but the things that you will own till you die. And in certain cases, that's not just jewelry. Um, the things that, for example, in my house, I love uh, collecting old glass from thrift stores and I love colored glass. So this is my china cabinet. And so these are things that I would probably, they're not worth much as opposed to the jewelry, which is worth a bunch. But these are things that I consider my keepers and I would keep these. So they're the things I like to live amongst, the things that add meaning to your house, that add color and texture and size. And what I would suggest doing with the things that aren't worth much, but you'd like to keep or maybe let, like to have your kids know about is make a video of yourself standing with those you know, open the closet door. In my case, I did a video. I opened the China cabinet as you see it here. And I talked to my kids, you know, the, this is why I'm hanging on to these things. There's a reason for it. It may not be value, but there is a reason. Okay, after your keepers, you have what I call the piddly smalls. Now the piddly smalls are backwards counterintuitive. The way people tend to go through their garages and their kitchens and their closets is they pull out the small stuff first, the stuff that means nothing that isn't worth very much. They pull that out first. And it is so time consuming. And basically there's no market for this stuff. And my suggestion is, is start, if you're going to get rid of things, start with the stuff that matters that you can actually make money doing and kind of quick through what I call the piddly smalls. I have a theory. My theory is that the smaller the object and the lesser the value, the greater the psychic space that thing takes up. So donate them. Donate them. I wouldn't even garage sale them. Just donate them. Now we come to the 10 valuable habits of successful downsizers. So objects don't define your essence or your worth or your family values or your attitude about your home. But attitudes about home and nostalgia has changed. And so... Uh, I have some valuable tips for you if you are downsizing. Number one, value related to ease of life, adaptability, portability, enjoyment by friends, sharing, status and lifestyle, utility, functionality, compactness, and short-term pleasure. A value is also sometimes microwavable and dishwashable. So, the exercise photo that I, you, you have here, I'm saying downsizers use those concepts of value that I just gave you, and they exercise a plan. They limit their work time. They give rewards to themselves. They uh, take wine breaks and chocolate breaks. They make visual pictures using technology, especially if you're moving house. You know, make a visual record, etc. So downsizers use digital technology. We talked about that. So, you know, use the digital technology, for example. This is what I did for mom when we moved her. We took pictures of what was in each box. So we used digital technology. We printed those pictures out right in the storage locker. So downsizers make permanent donation decisions. Why do I say that? Because so many times my clients will say, I'd like to donate this and this and this and this. Well, before too long, it's back in their house. So they've changed their mind because they, they get um, nostalgic in advance of the donation truck coming and picking it up. So make permanent donation decisions, kind of be brutal. Downsizers call upon experts. They call upon people that know how to move things in trucks. They call upon people that know how to appraise things, know how to insure things. They have a, maybe an idea of who, who's a good short-term hauler or mover. They have a really good idea about who has a truck that's a charity as well. Um, downsizers consider a short-term uh, storage locker. Notice the word short-term and bold. Now I say that because I have a storage locker that I've had for years. I pay $300 a month and it isn't short-term. So take a lesson from me, short-term. Downsizers avoid using their spouses. So in a relationship, there's always one person who's a stuff person like me and one person who's a non-stuff person. And, you know, 
you, yeah, it, there's always a, one of the kind in, in any relationship. So, you know, don't involve the people in your life who are non-stuff people because you're going to get a problem. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, all the husbands that maybe may not want to take part in your downsizing decisions. Okay, downsizers take advantage of the IRS donations. You see, this is an 8280 form and you'll find out that you if if it's anywhere between 50 and 500 dollars that you're donating you don't need me if it's anywhere between 2000 and over will need me and that's because the appraiser has to sign uh on such a donation successful downsizers don't visit donations that they're going to do after a glass of wine and you know as successful downsizers use a charity with a truck, for example. So they know a charity that owns a truck and that will pick up so that they are not sitting there with those objects in the garage for years and years because the longer you look at those objects, the more you will not donate. Downsizers use an appraiser for insuring things of value. So basically, if you are going to think about insuring, and a lot of people are calling me with questions, they're looking around their house because they've been locked in their house and thinking, what should I be insuring? Uh, there, you may even just send me some photos and I can tell you if they, uh, if you should be insuring them or not. So conclusion uh, of our talk today is, and then, you know, I want to see if anyone has any questions, but taste in the home is different and what objects in the home mean is different to different generations. And that meaning is also shape-shifting as we speak. So we're moving from objects as personifying our narratives and personifying our narrative history to a language of more impermanence. So we're using more images. I mean, basically you're listening to me on a lecture from Zoom, we're using images. So today's aesthetics are not necessarily fully centered, but today's are guided by the aesthetics of the prevailing technology. And what is that prevailing technology? Well, it's mainly visual, it's mainly virtual. So although we didn't have a choice, or I didn't anyway, about what I was going to uh, inherit from my mother, uh, I caution you, don't do what I did, and no sneak attack uh, with you know a pre-padded, uh, packed cardboard box mailed to your son or daughter, FedExed in the mail, all your china, all your crystal, uh, it won't be appreciated. And I hope you've enjoyed this talk. And maybe we'll open it up. Let's see. Thank you so much.